All right, welcome back, everybody. This is episode 14 of In Liberty and Health. I got Ben Seavers with me. Did I say that correctly? You did. Nice, nice. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good. How about yourself, Kyle? Great, great. I'm very, very pleased to have you on. Um, I'm very well, excited you. for you in particular because you got a pretty important position. Um, you know, we always talk about federal elections, governors now, especially after these last two years. Um, but I think a lot of people lose sight of just how important localism is and that uh, the collective closest to you is going to be the one that you can affect the most and perhaps maybe not the easiest, but that's perhaps the most obtainable one. So I think that's one that we should shoot for. But before we start kind of going down that rabbit hole, um, just kind of introduce yourself to the In Liberty and Health audience, explain kind of how you came to libertarianism and what kind of inspired you to get a little bit more politically active. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, and thank you for having me on. I, it's a real pleasure. Nice. I like I like doing this, talking to people and all that. So cool. yeah, um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in North Apollo, PA. Um, moved all around the town, been on every, mostly every single street in town, really. And I went to Apollo Ridge High School. Um, I'm currently 20 years old. I attend Grove City College for economics. And I've always kind of had the libertarian mindset. Um, I came to like a the libertarian party back in 2018 but I, i've probably been like a libertarian but for about a year before that so i, I supported dale kearns ken krochik and uh, kathleen smith in the 2018 election um they all drank for senate and ken was running for governor and uh, yeah ever since then i've been i've been involved i s supported jim christiana back in 2018 he was a republican candidate but he lost to like trump supported candidate you know the establishment guy and i'm like yeah i'm not doing this <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the, one of the catalysts. And like, I saw a lot of stuff happening in the Trump administration. I didn't like, like, such as tariffs, uh, money, m print, then basically cr creating a money by the Federal Reserve out of nowhere, drone bombing, stuff like that. I, I, I wasn't a huge fan of that, never really was. And yeah, I, that's what kind of got me in, into it. And um, Andrew Ria, his run for state rep this past uh, May, kind of got me really excited. And I'm like, wow, we can really build something here. So that, that, that's why I ran for council, and that's why I'm going to run for things in the future. Nice, nice. Well, that's awesome to hear. Um, so you're going to school in Grove City for uh, economics. If I remember correctly, yeah. there is a professor there. I know he's he's pretty big in the liberty space. Oh, God, what the heck is his name? Yeah, we actually have an Austrian economics program up here at Grove City College. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah that was going to yeah. be my next question is, yeah. do they teach you real economics or do they teach you fake yes. economics? Yes, um, they teach you real economics. Okay, uh, we cool, got, cool. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I yeah, was just got, on uh, Kareem, if you know Kareem Mays. Yeah, yeah, I know um, Kareem. Yeah, he, I was on his show last night and I, I was explaining kind of how I came to libertarianism. And one of the things that's always been intuitive to me about libertarianism is, and, and they're obviously separate, but you know, when you think libertarianism, yeah. typically you think Austrian economics. Austrian economics to me just is like the most intuitively sound, um, you know, theory of economics. It, it just makes sense you know, from like the most practical sense of view, yeah. when you start learning about Keynesianism or even listen to some of the Chicago guys, um, the, their theories of economics just don't quite intuitively make the same sense that Austrian economics is like, I feel like you could teach a five-year-old to understand Austrian economics and they'll be able to run with it. Like you hand them yeah. uh, how an economy grows and why it crashes by Peter Schiff, which is pretty much a kid's book. Um, and, and they'll be good to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Sorry, sorry to kind of go down that rabbit hole, but uh, go on. Yeah, yeah, we got uh, Dr. Sean Rittnar, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Herbner. Um, Jeffrey Herbner has been on. Uh, Dr. Herbner has been on uh, Tom Woods, I think, before, and Bob Murphy as well. Um, we got uh, Dr. Fuller. He's a younger guy. Uh, when he graduated. He graduated George Mason. He he just came out with a book actually. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have it right here. <laughs> like I can like I can plug him in if that's okay. Yeah, no, you're good. Uh, yeah, he just wrote this. He just wrote this book. Oh, okay. Book. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. He, nice. he, uh, it's been getting shared around a little bit, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I, I like I love like, I like all my professors, and uh, yeah, they're all very very libertarian oriented and very free market oriented, all Austrians. Nice. Yeah. So, um, in I guess the Austrian economic class in a college, um, is there a lot of people there? And what are the, what's the kind of demographic like? Like, are these more Trump esque people, or are there a lot of kind of like Rothbardian, or maybe even just kind of 
beltway libertarian people I'm, yeah. I'm really curious about this and i also asked eric brakey about this because he runs uh young americans for liberty or he's a senior yeah. spokesperson there um i'm really curious about the people kind of coming through schools now because i feel like our generation despite the fact that there may be a small majority of them for socialism i feel like there's also a counterculture to that where you know there's some people whose entire personality is built around being a trump supporter and then yeah. there's probably some <laughs> other people that are a little bit more open to libertarianism because um as you and i both know we're better than the right on the issues that they're good on we're better than the left that the issues that they're good on yeah 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 um you know it, it, grove city is kind of like an anomaly um it's a big conservative bastion up here in mercer county and uh, yeah, it, 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 it's kind of mixed. Like there, the, there's a lot of Trump supporters up here, but within the econ department specifically, um, there's kind of a few major groups. Uh, there's the people that come here specifically for the Austrian school. Mm -hmm. um, and there's people who come here because they know it's a very conservative school politically. And then there's other people that come here because it's a very Christian school. But I mean, everybody kind of has that basic uh, free market impulse in them. Most of the people that I've talked to, at least. Okay. I mean, I know I know a lot of the econ majors up here. They all have the like, same strain in them of free marketer and uh, ant anti big government. So yeah, it's it's not really like you, you don't see like the Alexandria Ocasio Cortezes here. You mm -hmm. don't see them um, even at schools that do teach um, mm -hmm. not Austrian economics. Yeah, they they agree like the professors at least agree on the basics with micro micro econ so they, they don't agree with like macro but they agree with micro okay but it mean, doesn't necessarily mean their students agree <laughs> yeah i, I was uh yeah. I, I thought about this as you said alexander uh aoc i don't yeah. fuck up saying her name but uh basically <laughs> if, if she went to an austrian school she would not be who she is today <laughs> she probably but, still would be that's the thing <laughs> you think yeah, I, I think if, she if, would be okay yeah and you may be right but uh if you can hear somebody, specifically someone like Peter Schiff or Ron Paul, I think they do like the best job of laying Austrian economics out in like the most digestible way possible. Because like I yeah. said, it always intuitively made sense to me. But then as soon as I listen to Peter Schiff, and I've listened to him so much over the last year, um, that's where it really clicked. Um, and especially after reading his book too. Um, like I said, the Chicago guys, you know, your Tom Sowell, um, Milton Friedman, Walter Williams, they're phenomenal and they're spot on about a lot of stuff. But then you start um, kind of getting into some of the stuff about taxes and um, they want to have a Federal Reserve, whereas Austrian yeah. economics prefer the, um, the interest rate be set by the free market rather than by a central bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, all the like the Milton Friedman crowd. Um, the monetarists, they all basically agree with like the core Keynesian concepts. They're just Keynesian lights, really. I mean, they, they don't, they, they don't, there's, they don't have a fundamental disagreement with Keynesians do at all, really. They right. just, they just, they just kind of came down to it. A lot of them just had the idea that monetary stimulus was better than fiscal stimulus, which mm -hmm. a lot of Keynesians had the idea that fiscal stimulus was superior. So really there's nothing fundamentally different about it. Mm -hmm. Except a lot of the same things. I mean, there's other there's other nuances, but at the at the core of it, it's it's not sound, it's not coherent. Milton Freeman himself, he was focused on making constructs that they didn't care whether they resembled reality or not. They just made these constructs, and if it had explanatory power, then they ran with it. And that's what they did. And people like Friedman and other monetarists never really responded to uh, Austrian critiques and Austrian methodology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, uh, I believe it's about an hour and a half, maybe even two hour video um, you can find on YouTube if you look up uh, Murray Rothbard, Milton Friedman, and he lays out like a huge critique of Milton Friedman, which, you know, to most people would sound like sacrilege, but, uh, you know, as everybody knows, Murray Rothbard's kind of like the, you know, the, the pinnacle of libertarianism and kind of what, you know, where anarcho-capitalism originated. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so kind of hearing him critique Milton Friedman's really interesting. And I wouldn't criticize the contributions that Tom Sowell, um, Walter exactly, Williams, yeah. or any of the Chicago guys have made because they've really introduced economics and like at least 
good economic theory, like kind of pushing you in that direction to so many people, whereas Murray Rothbard kind of, you know, took it to its logical conclusion and made the most beautiful philosophy that's ever been devised politically. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. Like, sure, the, the Freedmanites and the like, I mean, he had the TV show and what was it? PBS, like, mm-hmm. free to choose. I mean, that so many people probably saw that. But right. at the end of the day, it's like, I, I just wonder how how much how much misconception did they did people walk away from that show with? Like, mm-hmm. it never that that show was not against the Fed. Like when he talked about the Fed in the right. show, he was, was very like pro, like you know, moderation Fed. Like it's mm-hmm. all about like not a controls on the Fed or balancing gold gold payments and all that. But I mean, it's nothing fundamentally like it's not earth shattering, really. I mean, it's easy for people to accept that, especially. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a complicated thing for a lot of people too. Mm-hmm. So it's easy for like to listen to Milton Friedman, a PhD economist, tell you otherwise. Right, and uh, what a lot of people fail to realize, and this kind of plays into what we see going on right now. Um, the Federal Reserve generally is actually not even generally; it is the problem with everything that's going on right now because. You could literally boil this down to if the Fed wasn't able to monetize debt, if they weren't able to issue, you know, money to buy mortgage backed securities or buy bonds from companies or, you know, do all these bailouts, then we wouldn't be in this situation because then, um, you know, if we had a sound money policy where we had a gold backed currency, it imposes discipline on politicians. And that is a beautiful thing that people have lost sight of. Because, yeah. you know, then if you have financial discipline on politicians, then they have to raise taxes, right? But right mm-hmm. now with the Federal Reserve, they joke about the debt ceiling. Like, and it's so funny because under Trump, you know, the debt increased by eight trillion. He almost beat Obama's um, spending record in eight years or in four years versus where Obama had eight years, right? Yeah. Um, now that Republicans are out of charge, to their credit, they criticize Biden, which, okay, you can criticize him. I'll criticize him. There's many, 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 many things to criticize him about. But yeah. if you're going to criticize him on spending, you look like hypocrites because when Trump was president, you guys had no problem increasing warfare, welfare, spending, you know, even doing more bailouts, doing all the COVID stimulus. Um, you guys look like you have your pants down now because you authorized all this spending under Trump when you control the House and the Senate. And then now you want to act like you care about the debt when deficits didn't matter when there was a Republican president. So um, Mm. this kind of gets to the next point, though, of why I think libertarians and maybe even good liberty Republicans have a huge, huge, huge opportunity going into these next midterms and even into the 2024 election. Um, A lot of people are waking up to the inflation. They don't have their finger on what the cause is. Um, and, And it's, you know, plenty of presidents doubling the debt every single term. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of people are kind of waiting to hear this message of liberty. A lot of people want to hear, you know, you've been ripped off. The populist message from Trump was very, very popular and is very, very successful. The populist message and the anti-war message, that will get you elected, essentially. Mm -hmm. But the problem with Trump was he didn't follow through on any of it. So this kind of gets to the idea of the Libertarian Party, where we need to go the maybe not the whole populist route, but we really need to nail down, um, you know, about this inflation. We really need to phrase it in the way of your purchasing power is being stolen from you. It's not inflation. It mm-hmm. it is inflation, but inflation is stealing your purchasing power yeah. from you. Yeah, it's a hidden tax. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's the most malicious one because it hits um, the people on the lower income bracket actually worse than it hits rich people because rich people, their assets grow as the bubble grows, right? You blow more air into the bubble, um, stock prices go up, um, cost for medical um, procedures and stuff like that goes up, cost for um, vehicles go up, assets go up, but the poor people generally don't have as many assets, so the inflation hits them even harder. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And you know, that's what we really need to focus on going forward. Like, oh, we need alternatives. Like, mm-hmm. there's stuff like gold, silver. And I I don't know about cryptocurrency, but people should be allowed to, should, people should be allowed to use it. And they do. Right. I mean, and should, it should be not regulated and mm-hmm. it should be a, a, an allowable currency. Same thing with gold and silver. I mean, there's some states that are doing gold depositories. And I think that the more, the more people know about this, the more like they, they have the idea that, money comes from government 
right. that's not what money is. The only reason why we use it is because we're forced to use it. And right. Yeah. Like I see a lot of states having gold. They're printing gold backs and issuing gold backs like private privately. And uh, we need to start doing that on a large scale to just, just to show the Federal Reserve, like, look, we're not using your money anymore. <laughs> we don't yeah. want to. It doesn't. It's worthless to us. Right. It really well, is. Like basically what you're saying is that, you know, we need to opt out, which is yeah. huge because if we no longer use our currency and it, it is constitutional and legal to use gold and silver as legal tender, it's written in the constitution yeah. that you can use that. And it's actually unconstitutional for the Federal Reserve to be issuing the currency like they are. The only reason why they get away or get away with it is because they're a private bank. Mm. Although, you know, the head of the Treasury and the head of the Federal Reserve are, you know, hanging out, having beers at the bar, you know, after a uh, you know, yeah. after a hearing in the House. It's it's yeah. essentially the fox guard in the hen house, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I was reading um, uh, I had it around here. Keeping at it by Paul Volcker. And uh, he's a former fair, Ched Fair under the yeah, yeah, yeah. And he talks about when he was working in the Fed, like they would always try to like do some smoke and mirrors type of stuff, like yep. pretend like they're really not like buying like debt in mass. Like they would just like always when they when they buy it, they'd be like, oh, we're not. We're, they're just trying to like convince the people they're buying it from that the banks that they're oh we're not we're not we're not doing we're not doing quantitative easing. We're not doing that. Don't worry. Like it's it's just so dishonest and it's like it's so clearly political like they're mm. clearly doing it so the government can spend more so the government right. can have money and everyone's well, like that, right that's where well, it, it's not direct it's not direct people say yeah sure that's where the whole idea of inflation is good came from because if you have two percent of your purchasing power stolen from you every single year then the government doesn't look that bad because inflation benefits them because they can spend like drunken sailors because right oh, now yeah. we're at like 130 percent of uh spending what we take in in gdp uh, and to Volger's credit, he was the last um, Federal Reserve chairman that actually had any balls because yes. it, we, as you know, we've done the wrong thing now for about 30 years. Um, you know, when a recession happens in, you know, the Austrian business cycle states that the boom is the problem. The bust is the healthy part because that's when you can get rid of the malinvestment um that can be defaulted on and then people you know more responsible people can purchase businesses that weren't originally fruitful and then they can invest and then recreate the business in a more in a more productive capacity right so when we have this boom and bust cycle um normally what's supposed to happen is that interest rates are supposed to go up right yeah. so that way people are encouraged to save and then invest and then yeah. eventually you can decrease interest rates so that way people can buy or, you know, loan out money and then, you know, invest in other projects or spend or whatever they need to do. But what we do instead is as soon as a recession comes around, mm -hmm. we push interest rates lower, right? Exactly what we did with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in 2018 or 2019, they started to try and kick interest rates up a little bit and the stock market started to crash because guess what? It's a bubble and bubbles need artificially lower interest rates so that way you could push more air into it. Yeah. Um, so toward the latter half of Trump's presidency, he criticized Jerome Powell for not having interest rates low enough when as a candidate, yeah. he yeah. criticized the Fed for having artificially low interest rates. But then he wanted negative interest rates when he was president because it would benefit him because he could say, look how good the stock market's doing. Yeah. Everybody yeah, exactly. can borrow money dirt cheap. So um, then as soon as COVID came around, it exposed the weakness of the U.S. economy. It came yeah. out, you know, it pricked the bubble because we had no savings. So that's why they had to issue all the stimulus because the American economy was so weak. If we had a viable economy, everyone would have savings and we could you know, withstand a rainy day. But guess what? Nobody saved because interest rates are too low. Interest rates are too low, nobody saves. Yeah, yeah. And like, like the, whole, the whole thing with that is like a lot of resources get poured into, a lot of capital that could be going elsewhere gets poured mm -hmm. into enterprises that will not be finished. Exactly. Because by the time, it will come to like a like a crack point where they will not have any more scarce resources to finish the project mm -hmm. and they'll have to just liquidate and that's what happens that's what happens every single time and they don't learn their lesson of course mm -hmm. it, it, it never they never do and you know trump was a little schizophrenic on it like he went he would go around telling people well how we need to increase exports and he was like spreading this myth about how um if we have a weaker dollar it will just increase exports and make us all better all this for some re stupid yeah. silly reason mm -hmm. but i mean in reality it's like 
no. If you give somebody a U.S. dollar, they're going. To, what are they going to do with it? They're just going to hold on to it. No, they're going to spend it back into the economy. They're going to do. They're going to take that dollar and give it to people who actually use it. The United States, people in the United States, to get resources, services, or whatever. And if they don't, what's the big deal? At that point, we basically just got resources for like paper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny that you heard so much about us winning the trade war, but then we set a record um, trade deficit under his presidency of, I believe his initial one was 83 billion. And last month, um, I've done a few videos on this kind of assessing the health of the economy. And as we know, it's in terrible, terrible, terrible shape. But um, we just set another record trade deficit of, I think it was $93.4 billion. And as you and I would know, um, a healthy economy has net exports, right? We're, or we produce trade surpluses. So, you know, we don't have, we're able to export more than we import. But in this situation, it's so ass backwards that now all we do is print money and then send debt to people and then they give us stuff. And that's the explanation for the cargo ships because we've been buying so much stuff. There was so much money printed. 40% of all US dollars were printed within the last year, right? And then what everybody do? They went on a shopping spree. And then yeah. where'd we get all the stuff? We didn't produce it. We bought it from other countries. So guess what? Those countries have to send that stuff here. The cargo ships is not just a Biden problem. It is yeah. a Biden yeah. problem, but it started under Trump. And now a lot of the problems that started under Trump are now manifesting under Biden. And it's not even just necessarily just Trump's fault either. It was Obama's problem. It was Bush's problem. Because once again, this goes back to the Federal Reserve and keeping interest rates too low and making the economy one big bubble. Well, I mean, at the same time, if they didn't regulate, if they if they didn't regulate the flow of imports, exports out, I mean, there probably wouldn't be this issue of like, cargo ships off off the shore exactly, just like yeah. hanging out there like they would be able to go somewhere and like actually drop off a product but instead we have federal agencies involved in it to like from from point a to point b and they don't allow anything to go, get done without their say or approval it's ridiculous and you know it's not necessarily true that a healthy economy has more exports um it's it, it just people Every, every every trade is a voluntary trade, and if a voluntary trade, right. if, you're, if it's voluntary, then it's for some for both parties' benefit. Exactly. Well, yeah. Yeah. So if there's if there's if exports are exceeding imports, fine. That's not a problem because I mean, if, if it's natural, then it's fine. But I mean, what you're saying, of course, it's not it's not totally natural, and a lot of I think Republicans get hooked up on the exports because of the imports thing, and I think it's like they're barking up the wrong tree. Like it shouldn't be the right. focus of the increase in exports shouldn't be the focus. The focus should be ending the Fed. The focus should be ending restrictions on trade. The focus should okay, be yeah. getting rid of government involvement in the economy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think that's definitely a reasonable way to put it. Um, I, I guess I was more so referring to back in the, I want to say the 80s and 90s, we had more exports, right? Um, yeah. our, our we were so productive that we were able to give the rest of the world stuff and they wanted to buy stuff off of us, which made us richer because we were so productive. Now, government has made it so difficult for the U.S. populace to be productive as it encouraged so many people to not work, right? Our workforce yeah. participation rate is 61.7%, I think it is. And then the unemployment rate, this always makes me laugh, but the unemployment rate's like 4.5%. But the yeah. workforce participation rate is 61.9%. Well, what's the other 35% of people doing? It, it, that's so that, that's why when you hear people talk about unemployment, it's so disingenuous because it leaves out that 35% of people who could work that aren't working. Because if you've been unemployed for a certain amount of time, they just take you out. Yeah, and that's a problem. I mean, like when government is in charge of making statistics, they, <laughs> they're going to make the statistics to benefit them. Absolutely. And like, what's what's a bureaucrat going to do? Are they going to make statistics that like show that uh, who, that Biden's policies aren't working? Yeah. <laughs> like, it, come on, they, they 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 want their job. They want to keep their job. So they so they just like add in all this like save GDP for instance. GDP doesn't include all the intermediary intermediary stages of production. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm happy you're t- I'm happy you're touching on GDP because there's a uh, Peter Schiff video, and if you can't tell, Peter Schiff is like by far my favorite Austrian economist. <laughs> but um, he explains why GDP is a bad measure, and I'll, I'll 
kind of quickly touch on this and I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but I, I just love talking um, economics. Um, yeah, yeah. GDP is a bad measure because it doesn't measure leisure, right? If people have savings and they're able to go on vacations, right? Because they were so productive, then that's oh, yeah. not contributing to GDP, but those people still have a high quality of life. GDP yeah. does not measure that. So that's the problem with just looking at GDP when it comes to economics. Yeah. Is that you, well, you leave out that leisure factor. Yeah, there's not even that's that's like honestly, that that is a problem. And that's not even the biggest problem. That's probably the smallest problem with GDP. GDP, it, it doesn't it, it only it only includes like all produ all producer goods that are currently in production plus okay. all of the consu current consumer goods. So it doesn't include all of the producer goods that were put into making consumer goods. Okay. So when they when it, when it when it comes to the end of it, when they measure everything, they're like, oh, consumer goods are all that, that's all the economy is. That's all spending. It's that's all the economy is. We need more spending. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Government spending in it too. When government spending is not even productive, it's it's yeah. all consumptive, and it, it, it's just ridiculous. Plus, um, yeah, it, it, there's like better measurement GDO. Uh, GDO is a better measurement because it actually takes in more. But I mean, all of it still has like some fundamental issues. And even 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 then, if if it was completely perfect, when it comes down to it, the people who created GDP as a measurement, like claim that like they said I, I think the number was like it's like 30 percent like margin of error <laughs> like that is insane kuznets um i forget his first name but he was an economist in charge of like uh, i don't know if he's in charge i think he was in charge of the national bureau of labor statistics mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's right i think it was more i think it was a private entity but um he uh he did uh he made gdp he, he was a forerunner of that and he that's what he said that's one of his quotes i mean that was years ago so i mean the margin of error might have decreased but still, I mean, even back then, I mean, it, it, pro it probably is. I, mean, I, I can't think of anyone talking about the margin of error for GDP now. So, I mean, like, until someone tells me otherwise, it's going to be 30%. <laughs> right. but, uh, it, it's all to the whims of bureaucrats collecting this data. That's, that's who's determining it. So I don't trust any of it. It's, it's a bunch of malarkey, <laughs> as Joe Biden would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, it is true. But if you look at um, our GDP over the last like twenty years, I mean, it's usually averaging anywhere from like two to four percent. Yeah, and that's you know, I, even by their own measurement, that's pretty pitiful. And mm -hmm. I've had people tell me that uh, under Trump, he was, um, I think they said wages grew faster than inflation. But uh, I think if you bar twenty twenty that might be true <laughs> but then Maybe. if you include 2020 that's probably not true yeah yeah uh, okay okay yeah um yeah there's just a lot of problems with it and um yeah i don't i don't know what to exactly make make of that i don't know about the data from back yeah, then neither do i yeah I'd, I'd be interesting to look at that um yeah and see why that happened but i can't imagine why what, what good reason it would have to do that right <laughs> off my head yeah yeah i got you so um i guess kind of pivoting to another point here um your run for city council we, we kind of tapped on this at the beginning and then we dived down the rabbit hole economics and like i said that's just one of my favorite areas to talk about um it, it's very very important because as we see now they're starting to say vaccines are okay for children and i'm not anti-vaccine i'm just more so let's under let's have the full conversation right and yeah. that's the problem is that we're not having the full conversation because we leave out natural immunity we leave out the fact that kids generally are okay from this um yeah. kids don't really spread it either because part of spreading COVID is having a high viral load um being in city council you kind of have a little bit more say on what's going on in your locale so um could you kind of give a little bit more of a breakdown on how the city council deal has gone? I know you just got elected, so there's probably not a lot that's happened since. But, uh, you know, kind of give your understanding of what you can do and maybe even a little bit of what your plans are. And, yeah. you know, if you have to, you know, what 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 are all the obstacles in your way and who do you have to work with? I know it's a lot of questions, but uh, just kind of, I guess, dance around the topic of being on the city yeah. council. Yeah, um, so North Pole is a borough, and uh, yeah, the, the, the climate within the council right now is a lot of people are very law and order focused and very doing things by the book, 
even though the book itself is like not really is just more of a suggestion rather than a rule mm -hmm. and so i don't they haven't done anything like this they're very like focused on things as they happen that's that's typically the mm -hmm. that's typically what they do so they they don't ever do anything like oh no they don't have second amendment. we're not a second amendment second amendment sanctuary yet uh, it's not like they have they haven't ended the drug war yet on the local level why would they <laughs> and uh, that i don't expect them to and uh, they haven't taken any stances against the lockdowns or vaccine mandates and it's very they're, they, they're kind of like floaters in a way i mean not to insult them i mean they're all good people i, I think and uh but it's it, it's just like it's very like it's very slow and it's not very solution oriented so one of the things i'd like to do um is actually pass ordinances standing up to the federal government standing up to the state government standing up to vaccine mandates lockdowns gun laws uh, drug laws all of that and that can be done on a local level well it's an iffy territory but people are doing it. people are doing it and i'd want to do it and mm. they'll, they'll probably fight me on that and that's okay but everything will be recorded from here on out. So we're gonna be recording all the public meetings now. They didn't do that before, but uh, we're gonna be recording all the public meetings starting starting at the closest one. So um, yeah, I don't know if you wanna go, want me to go into like other ideas that I had for council, other stuff I'm doing, but uh, yeah. Uh, what what uh, Where do you want me to take this? Uh, roads? Um, I, I guess my <laughs> my next question <laughs> would be my roads. Uh <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, yeah, that right there, just not, not to cut you off, but yeah, yeah, yeah. my roads, my roads basically became the the only like the big argument against me. Like I, 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 at first, I, <laughs> oh my god, no, you're not serious. Please I'm not, I'm not, I'm not serious. joking. I'm not joking. The, oh, yeah, my god. I, I initially wanted to run on privatizing trash collection because that's a big issue in town. Everyone's complaining about it. Everyone complains about the roads too, and I think the roads should be just completely privatized and. <laughs> I didn't know, I just didn't think about it. I didn't know how much of a issue people would have of that. And, but like when, when I was door knocking, everyone was pretty receptive of it. And it's, I think it's pretty commonsensical when you have roads that haven't been done for 30 years. And that's like tens of thousands of dollars of the tax money that a house owner, if they really valued the roads could have taken and renovated the roads. They could have all gotten together on the road and said, look, our roads suck. Our property values are decreasing because of the roads suck. Mm -hmm. and our cars can't take it so let's do the roads and i don't know that that was pretty intuitive to a lot of people but at the council meetings they weren't as receptive because at the council meetings you had two groups the councilmen who were in government who were in charge of the roads some people there's like the roads were like that was their baby and um then like the people in the audience who some of them are some of them are like mainstays in bro meetings and it's like they're it's kind of like their pastime in a way so like government is like their government is like their it's like their civic duty they got to be there and you know I, I even said one time i think it's silly that we all have to be here right now doing all this stuff and i want to privatize everything so we don't have to be here so but uh, that wasn't received well by the people at the meetings but mm -hmm. door knocking the door knocking crowd they, they loved it so so yeah the, the, the my roads basically because I, I would some people would be like uh you want to you want to make you want to make us pay for all the roads uh, one person was like oh you, you you can't have everybody go out and buy their own uh asphalt layer i'm like that's not what i'm talking about <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah that, that issue. literally what you're asking for is hey you're already paying this yeah and look nothing's happening why don't we take this money that's already being stolen from you at gunpoint yeah. And let's actually use it. And this is what I hear actually very frequently from a lot of people who are working on a local level is that essentially it's just kind of inertia, you know, kick the can down the road, let's yeah. get our check, let's do whatever we want to do, and then, you know, let's go to our meeting, and then we'll hear a couple people out, we'll take some notes, and then we'll go to the next meeting in the same old, same old. But, uh, you know, you're a young face in there, and I'm sure people are very, very refreshed to hear that. Do you think that... Um, people are people have faith that you're going to get stuff done i mean i personally believe you will but um you know does it seem like people have an appetite for change that's a hard one i mean a lot of people want change in the direction i was talking um a lot of people don't and some people have a misunderstanding about what I, where i actually stand um 
a lot of people I think kind of have an idea, but uh, you know, I think that the most, I, what I can get done, uh, we plan to, we plan to run two candidates in 2023, I'm just saying. So we plan to take a majority in 2023, but in, within the next two years, what I think I can get done is make it more transparent, make people see where, what's going on at the council meetings and see how slow it is and see how like nothing really gets done. And I want, to, I, want, I, want, I want them to see where their money's going, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I'll be, say, I'll be making these arguments, the same arguments I'm making now. I'll be saying, look, we don't have to, I mean, I want to privatize everything, but I mean, I know you guys aren't going to agree with me on that. So let's make a common ground. And I, and I, I, I have like some ideas that aren't pretty common ground solutions that shouldn't be, that they, do, that they shouldn't really disagree with. Like, mm-hmm. I, I have one proposal. It's like, okay, let's say that you want to renovate your road, okay? And the government's not going to do it for another five years. So instead, what you could do is, okay, say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to contract out with someone myself or my neighbor for I'm going to contract together. And we're going to get someone paid the road. And in return, the, go- the government just cuts your taxes by so and so, so much percentage for like the next few, three to five years to make up for that, essentially. So like it's decentralizing it, putting putting the money back in control of the people. But I mean, if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to waste your time uh, contracting out, you can just default to the public option. And I, I find I don't find a huge issue with this. I mean, especially when the roads aren't getting paved to begin with. So I would hope that they would be open to something like that. And there's more like there's like there's marginal privatization you can do. Like there's stuff called paper alleys in North Apollo, which aren't alleys, but they're legal alleys. Like the government owns them, but they're just grass lots on people's yard, like in between people's yards. That mm-hmm. people on either side, they're 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 actually respond. They 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 mow the grass there. They're responsible for mowing the grass, but the, the government owns it, and they're not, and the people aren't allowed to do anything with it. And it's not even an alley, and they'll never make it an alley. So I mean, privatize that. I find I don't I don't see any issue with that. I, I don't think any like minded. I don't think any like commonsensical person would have an issue with that. It's just stuff like that. Privatize parking spots privatize road maintenance, partial privatized road maintenance, privatize alleyways, stuff like that. I mean, that, we need to ch- kind of chip away at it, you know? And there's some people who are sympathetic to the message. One person said, when I presented my privatized trash collection uh, idea, one of the council members said, if you would have proposed this two years ago, I would have supported it because two years ago, they were renegotiating their contract. And I'll, ho- I'll hold them to it. I'll say, look, when, when it comes to time to renegotiate the contract, I'll be like, look, we don't have to go this way. We can privatize it completely. Put the people in charge of finding their own trash collection company or take, or we put a list of like all the ones that want to provide the service to North Apollo and send it out to each people, each, each person, each household, and they can choose from that list we provide them. It doesn't have to be all out. It can be like that. And I think that's pretty agreeable. And I think that I could probably get something like that done. And um, yeah, it's it's not it's not gonna be like everything privatized overnight. That like when January third rolls around, when I get sworn in, and January fourth comes, it's not it, it's not gonna be like uh, and Kapistan tomorrow. And Kapistan. but um, it's it, I think that people's minds can be opened up to it. I think that I can convince some of them. I think we can get incremental privatization done. We can show people what's going on through recording meetings. And when twenty twenty three rolls around, and when people see what we're see what I'm doing, seeing if if I'm not allowed, if, if they're blocking me from stuff, they, they'll see that and we'll run two candidates and they'll hopefully win. So, Right. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and you said something pretty important in there that, um, you know, you hold them accountable. And this is a huge, huge thing. I will criticize Democrats. I will criticize Republicans and I will criticize libertarians because, look, we don't know what we're getting with libertarians at this point, right? <laughs> because there have not been that many elected libertarians. So us libertarians, we have to hold our elected libertarians 100% accountable. And if you're not going to be accountable to the people that voted you in, you should and you will get voted out 100% because look, we put you in there because we wanted stuff to get done, right? We want, you know, a more efficient government you know, as much of an oxymoron as that is, um, we want you to be what you said you're going to be. 
we're sick of the same old, same old. We're sick of just inertia carrying this overblown beast of a government down the road. Yeah. So, um, and this is my argument for the third party is that we don't know what could happen, but it could be fantastic. And yeah. if we all maintain pressure on the people who are running and the people who are elected, then I think we could see some really awesome stuff happening. Um, you know, in Pennsylvania, there was over 100 libertarians elected. We are the state with the most elected libertarians. And granted, it's, you know, a lot of the positions may not be, you know, senator, governor, or anything major. Yeah. But, you know, we're definitely working our way there. Um, there's a lot of people within the Mises caucus that criticize the Molten Maneuver, or criticize the Molten Maneuver, and I understand where they're coming from, but we don't know if that works. I believe the Mises caucus way of waking a bunch of people up and running local candidates will work as well, but I don't see these as mutually exclusive. So we don't know which one will work, but my opinion is, why not do our best to do both? Put all our eggs in both the baskets because we can do that, and see what happens. And I think we are starting to see that because there are a lot of libertarians getting elected. And, um, you know, who knows where we'll be in a couple of years. I don't think we're going to have a libertarian in the White House, but I don't think it's impossible. But on top of that, um, if we have libertarians elected at the local level, then, like I said, who knows what could happen? Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree with you. And even, even stuff like Constable, I mean, like, they can, they, they can do a lot of, they can do a lot of stuff I mean like they can choose not to exercise warrants like they, they 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 can choose not to take that route take the further take the take the extra step and get that like uh, classification they, they, they don't have to do that mm -hmm. um they uh and there's also the I think there's a loophole with uh people who have like weed cards mm -hmm. who aren't allowed to carry right. but I mean if they like the constable then they're allowed to carry so I, I've heard that a few times I don't know if that's actually accurate but Heck, there's a way to like increase liberty through a constable run, and mm -hmm. you know it's even just like constables are charged with um, maintaining peace on election day, and if the Republicans and Democrats like pull some weird stuff, um, we we need a good constable there to stop them. Mm -hmm. So like, there's some interesting uh, cases back when Drew ran his uh, state rep campaign. There's a lot of weird uh, stuff going on, like election boards and election uh, election precincts. Like one person was there was a, there was a person who nobody knows who this person is. The Democrats know who, don't know who this person is. Republicans don't know who this person is, and uh, we don't know who this person is. They were inside one of the precincts, um, trying to sway people to vote against the ballot initiative last election cycle, in, in 2020 in May, like to limit the governor's power. They were they were. Trying, they were trying to convince people to do that, and when they were questioned, they like ran away. Like, that's the type of stuff we need. Like, good election officials for stopping mm -hmm. people like that from coming in, like, and just pretending to be part of it, and then like trying to sway things. Like, mm -hmm. we need. That's why we need good election officials, and that will be vital for when, like, when libertarians run for bigger seats. I mean, say if there's like a libertarian state senate candidate or a libertarian congressional candidate, and there's someone inside, and, and this person's like actually like has a chance. And somebody's inside the precincts telling people to vote against this person. And like, you know, we don't we don't want that. We we need good election officials. And when it comes down when it comes down to that stuff like that, because in reality, the judge of elections, inspector, auditors, constables, they they can they have power, but they don't typically they don't exercise it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, auditors, you know, they they typically don't do anything, and then the boroughs like hire their own person and the auditors just sit back and they sit back with their title but i mean like libertarian auditors they have a chance they have mm -hmm. a chance to like actually get in there and reveal some potentially like crazy things that we know that's just going over people's heads like so yeah there's a lot of opportunity here even if like small small local positions in the end i do prefer running for stuff with like bigger teeth but i see a lot of merit in running for constable auditor judge of elections inspector all that and so on Right. Nice. Well, I think that's a pretty damn good note to uh, wrap it on. It's pretty optimistic. I, I do think that we're, you know, on the precipice of something great or something terrible. I'm hoping that it's going to be something great. <laughs> um, yeah. You, I believe you're doing great things to spread the message. I believe that you're doing great things within your work right now. And I think you will continue to push people in the right direction. And hopefully people have the appetite and they're ready for uh, what's to come. And hopefully what's to come is something good, not uh, something bad. So uh, 
I guess go ahead, plug your stuff, and uh, we'll rock and roll out of here, brother. Okay. Uh, plug what? <laughs> uh, your your pages and your information, where people can oh, find yeah. you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is my Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is official seekers. So, uh, like, you know, just how it sounds, official seekers, S-E-E-V-E-R-S. -E -E um, yeah, I'm on Facebook, Benjamin Sievers. Uh, that's about it. Um, I, have a, I have a LinkedIn if you want to connect with me on there. I have a LinkedIn, Benjamin M. Sievers. Um, and that's really it for me with social media. And may I plug one more thing? Yeah, I mean, if, you, uh, if you're interested in economics and if you are, have a kid who's going to be going into college, who's interested in it, and if you know someone who's going to be called for economics, Grove City College, best econ department in the whole world, in my opinion. Uh, very good Austrian program. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no better economics than that. So send your kid here. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> nice, man. Nice. Well, I had a blast. I'm very, very happy you got to come on. Um, we'll do Thank it again sometime, of course. And uh, until next time, everybody, this was In Liberty and Health. <laughs>